This is our last session before the lunch break. Before that, this year, PLF has an exclusive book stall at the venue featuring several titles by various publishers, including our speakers. Titles by Blue One Inc., Subu Publications, Sri Aurobindo Ashram, and Indica Books are specially featured. We also have an ind we also have independent stalls by Garuda Prakashan, Vitasta Publishing, Anadi Foundation, Kulcha Designs, and Story Mirror Infotech. Other than the wide array of books available, these stalls feature titles by all the authors speaking at PLF 2023. So don't forget to grab your copies and get them signed. We invite Dr. Shapam Das Gupta, former member of parliament and author, to speak to us about the past as present battles over history. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to stand between you and lunch for too long. Uh, so I'll try and exactly uh, ration my address. Firstly, for those who are extremely hungry, let, let me just tell you that this is not going to be as energetic a session as the preceding one. Neither is it going to be so emotive. But all the same, if you're interested in some food for thought, I think I'll try and give you some. Although I promise to speak about history, I'm not going to address the question of Sanatan Dharma, which I'm sure is a very relevant one, but which will probably be addressed in numerous other forums throughout the country in the coming days. Nor, for that matter, am I going to address the question of India Bharat, which I have written about in different ways. I'm actually going to take the subject to a very, very dif different level as to what happens to a country where disputes over history overwhelm everything else. And the fractiousness which happens, the instability that takes place, are some of the issues which are underlying themes. And the idea came to me about two weeks ago, around the time when I was presented with a carte blanche, so you can speak on anything you want to. But I'd gone to Dhaka. And in Dhaka, I arrived on a day which was about the concluding time of a one-month mourning period for Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who had died in 1975, who had been killed in 1975. So there was a one-month mourning period. And during various of the meetings which I take with, which took place, various Bangladeshi uh, ministers, luminaries, etc., all started their address with paying their tributes to the father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And the, throughout Dhaka and some of the adjoining districts, there were posters of various people who had put up, uh, sponsored the mourning posters of Mujib, etc. You know, with a, with a overdose of flattery, which normally accompanies these things as anyone who lives in Tamil Nadu can well testify. Uh, but when I did remark on this to some Bangladeshis, I was saying, wait, you've just come across uh, Mujib in one particular way. Now wait till what happens in November. Wait for November 7th to come about. So I said, what's wrong with the, what's the November 7th? As far as my recollection goes, it was the Bolshevik revolution which took place at that time. He said, no, 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 that's also there. Don't let us, you won't forget that. But November 7th is a very curious mixture. It's a time when a, individual, when a single day, a single event is commemorated in four different ways 
by four different political formations. Now let me strike you as a bit odd. Now let me give you what it is. Of course, I mentioned that it's to a small group of communists, unrepentant communists who are still there. It's the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, but that's scarcely observed these days. To the main opposition party in Bangladesh, which is the Bangladesh National Party of Begum Khalid Azia, it's marked as the National Revolution and Solidarity Day. Translated in Bangla, it is Jatiyo Biplob O Shanghati Dibosh. Now, let me just tell you by way of a footnote that August 15, which is the commemorative day of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's assassination, murder, is also commemorated as the birthday of Begum Khalid Azia. So while one side is mourning, the other side is cutting a cake. Now, a lot of people say it's actually not her birthday on 15th August. But it was deliberately put in there to drive home a point. Now, I'm not going to get into that particular controversy about whether that's true or not. But it does tell you a story somewhere. Okay, now back to November 7th. There is a party there a slightly left of center revolutionary party called, which in Bangla they call Joshot, but actually it's called the Jatiyo Samajtan Tegdal, which observes November 7th as the day of civil and military uprising. So why it is done so, I'll come back to that later. And finally, we have the Awami League, which observes November 7th, as the Mukti Jodha Shahid Dibosh. It's the freedom fighters, uh, martyrdom. Now, what happens between 15th August, and I'm talking about the assassination, not the birthday, 15th August and November the 7th. 15th August, you have the assassination of Mujibur Rahman. That leads to a certain turmoil in Bangladesh society. As a lot of people say, that a lot of the suppressed energies, political energies, which were there, which included people who were explicitly pro-Pakistan, suddenly found the moral courage to once again come out onto the streets. 71, if you recall, was the time when the Pakistani crackdown took place and 72 was when the Bangladesh new regime got into effect. Now, in 1975 August, there was a coup plotted by various army people who objected to the fact that those who had assassinated Muji were now running the government from behind in the presidential palace. So they mounted a coup to say, let the chain of command be established. It was such an innocuous, nice term. Let the chain of command be established. While this was happening, another lot of people got into action and said, but these people who are plotting the coup are actually pro-Indian agents. So they should be ousted and they should be ousted by a secret committee of ordinary soldiers who are imbued with the revolutionary spirit and they should actually be allowed to get the vote. So you had an upsurge of ordinary people, ordinary soldiers who went around Killing officers, and actually five or six major officers in the cantonment were killed, including their families, by these soldiers who said it's time for a Bolshevik revolution to come up. And finally, you had 
then the ousted commander who was sitting there idly under arrest at the cantonment taking over charge getting hold of the plotters of the 7th november uh, no, november uh, coup having them killed arresting those people who were trying to make the so called workers revolution with the soldiers and then taking a seizing charge so you have three parallel things operating in tandem a complete situation of chaos which took place now why does why is this relevant in forest history is concerned because to my mind what is important here is what happens when certain questions constantly are never addressed when you try and paper over cracks in society and say that it doesn't matter these are things of the past don't let's talk about them so let, let me just come to the question mr thing what are these questions which were the first question which was never explicitly addressed is why was east pakistan stroke bangladesh i'm not going getting into bangladesh so much as to why was east pakistan created in 1947 now to some people it was very clear what was that this was going to be an assertion of the muslim homeland for people indian muslim getting their home and that was going to be what was east pakistan actually it was the, the idea of east pakistan came about later it was pakistan that it was a geographical absurdity is another matter altogether but it was pakistan and that pakistan in the minds of people like mohammad ali jinnah and others was very clear this was a pakistan which was going to be defined by a certain degree of islamic virtues it's going to be defined by a muslim language which happened to be urdu and there was no ambiguity on their part as far as this was concerned and neither was there ambiguity on the part of a large number of people who were part of the muslim league in undivided bengal but there was ambiguity in the minds of a lot of people who were part of the rank and file of the muslim league because they sort of had this idea of that there is a bengali muslim space in pakistan that there has to be a space for bengali muslims that this is this is very different from what happens in punjab and sin then nonor nwfp etc and that what but what exactly is this bengali space if it is language if it is culture what is muslim bengali about it so there is this whole question of shrouded in ambiguity as to what exactly and there were people who had there was a quite an energetic literary movement there which people had not explored so far which was called east pakistan renaissance society etc which existed in calcutta till 46 but the idea which was different and this is what it comes about is that this muslimness of east pakistan east bengal was that it was not going to be hindu so rather than what it is going to be it was defined by what it is not going to be and again this whole thing became a very bit of a confused morass because the language itself was so heavily dominated by what might be called hindu illusions it was a very sanskritic language the illusions were very very uh now let me quote to you uh one of the most theoret uh, a theoreticians i mean just for the sake of brevity let me quote to you one of the theoreticians of what is called bangladeshi nationalism as opposed to bangla nationalism and that's a very interesting point how did people know 
in when Mujibur Rahman was killed, that actually this had been a coup which had actually done a 180 degree ideological turn. Number one, they changed the name of the radio station from Bangladesh Betar to Radio Bangladesh. Number one. Number two, instead of saying Joy Bangla, they said Bangladesh Zindabad. So that became a signal. So you can see how subtle these things were. Now, let, let me just tell you uh, how these things are. The ends, And the, the, this is, I'm quoting from a gentleman by the name of Mahmoudu Rahman, who believes that the whole existence of Bangladesh today has been subverted by India and by an overwhelming in Hindu influence which has taken place in Bangladesh. He feels that Bangladesh therefore needs to be detoxified. Not his words, but that's I'm more or less thing. Now just give it. The entire concept of Bangladesh Bengali nationalism, he writes, was built on the cultural plank created as a result of the Hindu renaissance of the 19th century aided by British colonial power. Immediately after the liberation of Bangladesh, Many Hindu customs were patronized by the ultra-secular elements in the guise of returning to Bengali culture. Young Muslim girls were seen wearing shakha and shindur, a religious custom for married Hindu women, claiming the fad to be part of Bengali culture. The use of Mongol Pradeep, fire worship at Diwali and Kali Puja, at the beginning of any political or cultural function, basically what we're talking about is that, was branded, uh, 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 at the beginning of any political or cultural function, had crept into Bangladeshi society after liberation in the name of Bengali culture. Anyone daring to criticize the custom as un-Islamic was branded a collaborator of the Pakistani regime and an Islamic fundamentalism. Now, he basically goes around saying that, you know, there is that there are two different societies at play here. One is a Bengali Hindu society, one is a Bengali Muslim society, and they have nothing in common with each other. Now, the point which here we are talking about is that these are questions which are very fundamental. And these are questions which in a so social setting had to be addressed at some point. But for various reasons, they were left unaddressed and un totally. And they come up and resurface at a time at a political level. They come up and more or less create divisions within the political society. The other question which is not addressed is what do you do with those who felt that while what Pakistan may have taken certain wrong political terms, but that Bangladesh actually belongs to Pakistan. And that contributes about something like 20 to 30 percent of Bengali society. And this was an issue which again was never formally addressed. So you had this entire question of who was a collaborator and who was a freedom fighter actually coming and disrupting everything from day one. I'm coming to all these questions because here we are seeing issues that what happens when you leave certain cultural and political come historical questions unaddressed. You leave them dangling in the air saying, no, 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 these are two things or you take wildly contradictory stands around it. What it happens at that case is that the entire basis of your nationhood gets very, very seriously fractured. And you get a system 
of not a political instability. Political instability happens to various things. But here the issue in Bangladesh is not ordinary political instability. It's political instability followed by large-scale massacres also. Of entire political leadership being actually eliminated. In 19, August 1975, Mujib and his entire family, including a 10-year-old son, was eliminated. In, in August, some of the remaining Awami League leaders who were put into jail were massacred inside the jail. So, the idea is to cut off everything. In 1981, Ziaur Rahman was killed by fellow army officers who believed that Ziaur Rahman was actually taking the nation back in a particular way, was killed in Chittagong. He was completely, I mean, the people who actually tried to restore some remnants in the order were all killed. So there's a killing. In, in some, some uh, Air Force people tried to Organize a coup. About 1500 Air Force people, or Army and Air Force people, were hanged. 1500. Can you imagine a situation like that happening in any other society? In India, can you imagine? Even if, okay, three or four recalcitrant soldiers or something is done to that. 1500 of a, of a country's armed forces gets killed. Then you have the ongoing trials even now of who is a collaborator, who is not Mujib's. Mujib's killers were first given an amnesty. Then again, the th three changes in the law takes place. The point which I'm trying to get at, and perhaps it's, it's perhaps relevant to India, is that Bangladesh may be a very extreme example Of what happens when the idea of history is put in the back burner, when there is no when there is no attempt made to have a, a coherent narrative of the past, and that is why the debates on Sanatan Dharma or even what is Bharat acquire a certain degree of importance. Not because, you know, some historians will, or some academics will come and talk about it. Of course, they will come and talk about it. But of course, what sort of, what idea of the past do we have? And it's when that idea of the past gets nullified and becomes a fractured object then you have these sort of tensions going on in society and of which Bangladesh happens to be the most vivid and probably the most extreme and sometimes the most ridiculous example of. I mean, there is an element of farce which accompanies what, what happens in Bangladesh. But that element of farce takes place because certain serious questions are not always addressed. So those who often say that why are you obsessing about the past? Why are you obsessing about this? We should move ahead. Let's look on. Let's move on. How does it matter what these things, what was said earlier? There is always that danger of this coming to haunt you of coming to bite you and the directions which this takes probably may not be as serious as in India as it was in our neighboring country and in Pakistan it's even worse. But if we take a lesson from all the others from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, and I would say, even from Afghanistan, I would say why it is necessary in this neighborhood that we pay 
a far greater attention to what sort of narrative we actually have a national narrative. This national narrative does not necessarily mean that all other parallel narratives become illegitimate. They may have a certain value at some point. But there has to be a mainstream discourse. And that mainstream discourse, it is very important to establish that mainstream discourse. And the importance of the culture wars which are taking place today and are linked to the history wars is due to this, that you have a coherent idea of what constitutes India, what constitutes Bharat, where are they so together, where are they different. And once that idea is there, you will probably help not undertake some of the mistakes which some of our neighbors have had, nor will you go through some of the more absurd type of self-flagellation which some of the Western nations are at present taking place in the guise of Black Lives Matter, anti-slavery, and they ridiculing their own sense of self in the process of trying to do prior chits for something else which they have no control of. I'll leave it at that. It's four minutes to, and I hope um, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm sure lunch is um, preferable. Thank you. Since you talked about Bangladesh, uh, the perhaps the problem with Bangladesh, not with 1971, mm -hmm. but with 1946 or even earlier 1905. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, Sheikh Mujib himself, I, I, his unfinished autobiography is actually quite a shocking document for for Indians. Uh, he, throughout his life, he was, I mean, he, he was a comp he was a committed Pakistan advocate as a young man. His first thing he did as a as a public figure, politician, was kill the Hindu Mahasabha leader of his region. He's quite open in his autobiography. He's a bad man. He, he's something dotto needed to be killed. So, uh, th and that is where he began. And unfortunately, we, uh, I mean, he was the best we had. He was the best we had as a as a national figure for East Pakistan. There was actually somebody else. There was Hazrul Haq, who was probably better than him, but he was long dead. So I think the, the problem with that country's narrative is that even the so-called uh, secular figure was secular only to a very limited degree. No, no. And, I, and therefore, why using the word secular? I mean, was there any surety? The larger question I think you should answer is, was there any definite surety within East Pakistan stroke Bangladesh as to what, why, why are we here? Why is this country there? Was there any surety about that? Wasn't. Because, and some of those questions which you asked about Mujib's own particular confusion about where he stood in 1946 to where he stood by 1967. When he went to Agartala to actually ask for Indian help to please create a new uh, country out uh, to have East Pakistan separated from Pakistan. So he did, after all, ask India definitely for help. So, so people changed, but was there any surety within the country itself? Is there any surety within that country now? That is the question I'm saying, and partly because some of these de debates are not being held. People would rather observe a particular day, go, go in for a sloganeering and, you know, some three mass processions or four commemorative days and uh, end it there and then. So that's, it's, it's, it's a sort of small warning to us that why we should 
try and attend to these issues with a greater degree of seriousness than we are sometimes accustomed to.